Hi guys, um, hope you're keeping busy at home. Um, I thought I'd read you the next part of our book, The Unforgotten Coat by Frank Archon Blyce. Um, when someone said, Is it really like that where you, come, where you come from? Chinggis said, Yes, nothing has changed. What did you come to Bootle for then? When everyone sniggered, he just shrugged his shoulders and said, We are nomads. We move around. I didn't do all this out of the goodness of my heart. It was part of my plan. I wanted to be asked back to their house. I imagined it would be stuffed with silks, with a horse head fiddle in one corner and a samovar bubbling in the other. I really had done my homework. Thanks to my obsession with Mimi's makeup, I already knew a bit about getting yourself asked back to places. All you had to do was walk with someone until they were nearly home and say, oh, is this where you live? And if that wasn't enough, just say you needed the toilet. Once you were through the door, their mother usually asked you to stay for tea. This didn't work with Chinggis and Nergai though, for the simple reason that they seemed to take a different route home every day. One day, they'd head left up Hawthorne Road. So the next day I'd go that way and wait for them to catch up. I'd wait for ages and then discover they'd gone off down the avenue. So the next day I'd go that way, only to see them turn around and walk back the way they'd come, heading straight past me. Sometimes I'd dis um, they'd disappear into the terraces, sometimes they'd even slide off into the back alleys. I gave up trying to follow them, but whenever I was out, I would look at the windows of the houses and flats, wondering if one of them was theirs, and feeling certain that somewhere in the narrow streets or tower blocks there was a room with silks and the samovar like a secret gateway. Somewhere in Bootle, Xanadu was buried like treasure. Then, one day, I went into Saavedra's shop for a packet of Monster Munch and a bottle of Sunny Delight. And there they were, the two of them, standing in the doorway looking at me. Chiggy said, are they good? Pointing at the Monster Munch. I offered him some and started slow, slowly walking towards my house. Chinggis crunched the munch. Mmm, yes, it's good. You can give some to their guy. We walked along, with them dipping into my monster munch every couple of metres. I subtly changed course whenever they changed theirs. I chugged some sunny delight so I could be convincing when I asked to go to the toilet, but somehow we ended up outside my house and not theirs. I need the toilet said Chinggis. And so does Nergai. Do you have toilets? Sure. Come in. As soon as they came through the door, my mum asked if they wanted to stay for tea. Sure, said Chinggis. He and Nergai went up to the toilet. Mum asked me if I thought they'd like fish fingers, or is it against their religion? Uh, I'm not sure what religion they are. They eat normal school dinners. We heard the toilet flush, but the boys did not come down. We could hear them walking around upstairs, opening doors and even drawers. That's a bit much, you know. Doors are one thing, but I draw the line at drawers. She couldn't, in fact, draw the line. Because Chingis walked into the kitchen and said, Please, we need to bake something right away. Do you have flour? Something in his voice managed to infect Mum with a baking panic. Personally, I'd never heard of emergency baking before, but Mum was yanking a mixing bowl out of the cupboard like it was a fire extinguisher. Bags of flour, slabs of butter. She threw them onto the table like medical supplies. Yeast? Yeast? We don't have yeast. It seemed that we might all be doomed by lack of yeast and that only Chinggis could save us. It's okay. He said, this time I'll do it without yeast. Stand back, please. And warm the oven. Mum more or less ran to the oven and Chingy started throwing stuff into the mixing bowl and bashing the dough about. Nergai stood there watching as though it was heart surgery. And his heart was in the little mixing bowl. It was only when I said, what is it exactly you're doing? That things started to calm down. Yes, said Mum. What is it exactly you're doing? Do you have raisins? Asked Chingis. Yes. 
She passed him a bag of raisins and he squeezed the dough into the shape of a little boy and added raisins for the teeth and the eyes. You know, if we're going to eat this, you should have washed your hands, really. This is not for eating. Not for us to eat, anyway. We need something else to eat. What do you have? Mum said she was thinking of eating fish fingers if it wasn't against their religion. There is a religion in this country that forbids fish fingers? Asked Chingus. Uh, no, I don't think so. I'll, I'll plumb. Do you want to phone your mum and tell, him, uh, tell her you're staying here for tea? No, we are nomads. She doesn't expect us to come home like children who are not nomads. Maybe we'll stay here for the night. Oh, will you? Maybe, said mum. Maybe you won't either. Chingis glanced at the no guy, then he looked around the room as if checking that no one was listening. Mum had this mirror near the back of the door next to the See How I Grow chart. Chingis went over, took the mirror off the wall and turned it face down on the table. Then he closed the blinds. We are telling you something in secret, he said. He looked at Nurga again. Nurga nodded. My brother believes he's been chased by a demon. A demon? said Mum. In Bootle? Are you sure there's only one? We have to take steps to save him, for instance. Nergai is not his name. We never speak his name. Nergai means no one, so if the demon hears us speaking to Nergai, it thinks we're speaking to no one. Right, said Mum. Well, obviously. I don't know why I didn't think of that myself. Also, we have to take a different room home, different route home from school each night so that they can't easily find out where we live. But it doesn't where you go to school. He saw it in school. Twice. So he has actually seen this demon then? Of course. How would he know it was following him? We are not people who are afraid for no reason. Of course not. Um, so what does it look like? It's in disguise. It looks like an ordinary man. So how do you know it's a demon? Because it wants to make him vanish. It's a demon that makes things vanish. Right, said Mum. That's why we had to leave Mongolia. This demon was there and it wanted to make us vanish. So we had to leave. We walked along the railway track that led out of our country. We followed the railway for days and days until we came here. There's a direct rail link from here to Mongolia, really? No, not direct, no. We make many changes. We do it to confuse the demon. And now I have made this boy out of dough. And if we leave him on your doorstep, then maybe if the demon has followed us, it can think that this is no guy. And maybe that will vanish instead. Great plan, said Mum. Now, if you're going to eat fish fingers, go and wash your hands. So they stayed for supper. Before they ate, they put the dough boy on the doorstep. While we were eating, as we watched, we watched the door and we couldn't help it. The lights as the cars went by, the voices of passing people. They all seemed like demon-related activities to me. A few weeks before, I had not known that there was any such thing as a portable bamboo palace. I hadn't even known there was such a person as Chinggis Khan, who had been born with a clot of blood grasped in his fist and who had conquered nearly the entire world in hardly any time at all, sweeping over the steppe into Central Asia and right up to the very gates of Europe. I hadn't even known there was such a place as the steppe. The step that was flat as a pavement but wide as the sea, with nothing but grass and great bustards. Wide as the sea, and I hadn't even known it was there. If there were seas of grass and woven palaces in this world, why wouldn't there be demons too? And why wouldn't one of them be crouched on our doorstep, in William Morris Road, right at that minute, munching a boy made of dough?